Hello, and welcome to Depth Insights, where we take a depth psychological look at news, topics, and events that are going on in your world today. I'm your host, Bonnie Bright, and as most of you know who listen to this show regularly, I'm also the founder of Depth Psychology Alliance, which is an online academic community for everyone who's interested in Jungian and depth psychologies. And you may also know that Depth Insights is a media series which was created to provide content for Depth Psychology Alliance and also for everyone who is in the depth and union psychology communities. So I'd like to welcome my guest today, Craig Chalquist, who is a core faculty member in East-West Psychology at CIIS, California Institute of Integral Studies, and who is also a former core faculty member at JFK University. And Craig is also an academic advisor and an adjunct faculty member still at JFK, as well as at Antioch University, Prescott College, and Pacifica Graduate Institute, among others. Craig is also a permaculture designer and a certified master gardener, and he's the author of six books and the editor of two anthologies. He's been around the depth psychological world for some time now, so I'm very excited to have him here. And we're going to find out a lot about his various projects that he has going on. So, Craig, thanks so much for joining me on the show today. Thank you so much, Bonnie, for having me on here on Depth Insights. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm always happy to have you on because you have so much going on, and I just want to be sure to let our listeners know your resume is so impressive. There's no way that I could possibly begin to outline all the things that you've done in your career here. And so I really encourage everybody to go and learn more about Craig and the work that he's done on his website at chalquist.com, and that's spelled C-H-A-L-Q-U-I-S-T. Dot com. And, of course, one of the main reasons that we're here is because you're featured in the month of June for the Depth Psychology Alliance Book Club, and you're going to be talking about your offering, Rebirths, Conversations with the World in Sold, which is a pretty amazing anthology, if I do say so myself, and we'll talk <laughs> more about that in just a minute. But, you know, Craig, also, you've approached depth psychology from so many angles, and you've really walked a lot of landscape within the space of depth psychology, um, both because you've studied a variety of different approaches and different angles, I guess, but also I know you're in the midst of some really creative projects right now, which I hope we'll talk about in just a, a few minutes as well. Meanwhile, first and foremost, I always think about you as a parapsychologist, because when we met several years ago, that was really something that was new for me, and I thought it was just such a fascinating term. Can you talk to us about that term, parapsychology, which I believe is a, a term that you coined, and tell us why it's important to us? Sure, I'd be glad to. The word actually came to me. I was out walking somewhere, and I had been studying a lot of eco-psychology in, in addition to death psychology for my doctoral work, and I was trying to put those things together in my mind. And... Some of what I found in eco-psychology was and continues to be helpful. It's a primary way that I, I not only teach and address questions of psyche in place, but it's also, a, for me, a worldview. And yet the, the eco-psychology that I was studying didn't have too much of a strong component for understanding how places and things and creatures and matter really work their way into our psyches. We used to call that animism, the sold quality of the world, and of course, Hillman talks about that, so I found that helpful in depth psychology. But I thought, you know, what we really need maybe is a terra psychology, T-E-R-R-A, you know, a psychology that really takes Earth as a psychical being in, a, in all the different ways that that means. And, and so I just started playing with the word, and I didn't intend it to be a, a new department or a new discipline or anything like that, and it's not really. It's more like a way of looking at the world. But in brief, what it refers to is, when we do parapsychology, we're looking at earth and land and place and even matter as a psychical presence that we're deeply connected to and usually unconsciously connected to. And so I can give a very simple example of it, actually. I live here in the Bay Area, and any ecologist would tell you that we're living here in a huge estuary. And an estuary is a place where all kinds of different influences, ecological influences, meet and mingle with each other. So saltwater and freshwater um, species that you would never see anywhere else joining together, getting nourished. An estuary is what permaculturalists call an edge place. And depth psychologists are well aware of the psychic richness of the depth places in our psyches where conscious and unconscious meet. And so a terra-psychological way of looking at the Bay Area is simply to explore the idea that the Bay Area is not just um, an ecological estuary, but also a cultural, psychological, and spiritual estuary as well. 
Mm-hmm. So the tarot psychological move is to, to be open to the idea that geography and geology, and even in infrastructure, buildings and cities, actually are psyche. So if that's true, then we can interpret what happens in those places as much as we can interpret dream symbols. Mm. So that's the kind of fun that we've been having, <laughs> all of us who do this, you know. Yeah, I mean, I well, you took me aback a bit with the use of the word fun because, of course, you know, when I think about dream interpretation, it, it can be very fascinating type of work. And uh, and however, I, as I was following you there and thinking about the estuaries and thinking about you know, the, the state of the planet, the furthest thing away from my mind was fun, of course, because <laughs> I find myself, you know, quite concerned, as many people do these days, about what's oh, going yeah. on our planet from an ecological standpoint. Um, however, I, I just I do think that it's such a rich technique to be able to to look at the world around us in this way and to be able to draw some meaning from what surrounds us by y- using this kind of uh, a practice and this kind of a lens to look at the world. So I can really see the connection between the work of terra psychology and, of course, its correlating sort of field, eco psychology. And the book that we're going to be talking about today, which is the featured book in June on the Depth Psychology Alliance Online Book Club, and that book is Rebirth, Conversations with a World Ensouled. And so, of course, that word ensouled is something that really seems to have kind of a magical ring about it to me, and, and it's exactly what you were talking about, what we have traditionally called animism, this idea that everything is alive and, and has a soul about it and has has something significant about it that we can interact with. Can you talk to us a little bit about the book? And I'm particularly interested in the the title of the book and where that came from. But I'm also, of course, very interested. You've written several of your own books, which are all around these same kinds of topics. And it's very clear that you are passionate about this and that you have been able to tease out a lot of information and and present it in a way that's very clearly written. And I really enjoy your books. You're, You're a very good writer. And, of course, not everybody that writes a book, you know, I can say that about. But this book is an anthology, and so you have chosen to gather the works of several, of many people, actually, into this one book. So maybe just talk about it however it feels right to you and and how it came about. Sure. I I actually put the book together itself in a spirit of fun. And I should qualify what I mean by fun, because you're absolutely right about the disastrous realities that we have to deal with. And, of course, what the public ignores is the huge psychical impact of the multiple environmental crises and and all the other crises, too, the war and poverty and the racism and everything else, you know. And so so in order to work out ideas, I have to be able to bracket all that to some extent and put it temporarily to one side and play with ideas. Right. So so for me, it's all of this is very much in the spirit of play. And if we get time, I'll, I'll say a little bit about a tour that I do for a, a course I teach at CIS where the students and I actually go out into the neighborhood around the school and we take a two-and-a-half-hour tour of what's called Soma, south of Market in San Francisco. And we look for mythological images and recurring motifs and things that tell us about the personality of the neighborhood. And it's just I learn new things every time I do it. It's just fascinating work. So we play with the ideas as we're out there, you know. So anyway, I had written the book, the first Terra Psychology book, and that was primarily intended for graduate students. And so the level of work in it reflects that, the style of the language that I used. And it's also a book that's primarily place-oriented, so because that's what my thinking was at the time that I was first doing this work. But although I coined that word Terra Psychology, it, it became evident pretty quickly that there were other people who were doing similar kinds of work in many different ways. And so... As I got to know more and more of them, I thought, you know, this is really the kind of work that needs to be done in all kinds of different directions, many of which I could never hope to do or anticipate. So let's all talk about what the kinds of terror psychology that we do, because it's also very different. Um, some people like to actually analyze places like psyches, and then other people just have a completely different approach, but they're still doing terror psychology. They're still doing deep work with place. So I wanted to get 29 other people together and do a really nice collection that, just going by the table of contents, we divided up into different areas. So I wrote the introduction for the anthology, and then we divided it into sections called elements, 
where people talk about working with different elements in nature. We have a section called places, another section called bodies because the work gets into the body, and the body is, of course, our own little piece of nature itself. There's a section called things that deals with, well, your your piece um, between honey and pain is they're dealing with colony collapse disorder and the, the deep cultural and psychological implications of that. And Matt Cochran wrote a piece on uranium and how that plays out in our culture, and, and there's a piece on stones also. And then there's a section called methods, and it's how to actually do the work contemplatively or, or very analytically and other ways of holding it. And then the last section is called ethics, and it deals with some of the implications of looking at the world this way. And that section includes some really great pieces. Karen Diane Knowles wrote something about our animal kin and how we relate to them. And Rebecca Elliott wrote a piece on what it means to actually be in touch with the beauty of the earth and the implications of that for a new kind of earth ethics. So that's the book in a nutshell, and it was really a pleasure to put it all together. And I should mention for listeners that the first word in the title, Rebirths, is actually spelled R-E-B-E-A-R-T-H-S. And that's exactly what the work means to those of us who do it. It's a whole series of being born again into new kinds of earth consciousness, which is often very painful as well as very joyful. Yeah, indeed. You know, I I was absolutely so thrilled to be able to submit something to be a chapter in this book. And, and as you mentioned, my particular chapter was about colony collapse disorder, which is this mass vanishing of the honeybees. And I know for me, I mean, it was such a labor of love. You know, it's it's a topic that I'm so passionate about. And I really have the impression when I read this book that every single contributor contributed with that same kind of, of feeling in mind, that same intention of just bringing something to the table that was so powerful for each one of us. And I, I mean, it's just become such a profound package of anybody who's interested in Earth, which is all of us as far as that goes, mm-hmm. I think will find something that really touches them within this, the pages of this book. So but I'm really curious, actually, because you ended up publishing this yourself. You created, in fact, an entirely new publishing company to be able to publish this book. Can you tell us about that? What on earth, <laughs> so to speak, <laughs> made you decide to create a publishing company to publish this particular book? Oh, and it's and I've used it since then for others, too. I have some concerns about commercial publishing the way that it's usually done, and and primarily it was an irritation with the length of time it takes to publish something. I've had good experiences publishing with commercial presses, but it's so lengthy. You know, our ecotherapy book, which was published by Sierra Club, that ended up taking us about two years to finally get it published, and Mm -hmm. there's something that the book loses when it stews for that long. It's like an alchemical reaction that's allowed to burn for too long and it calcinates or it coagulates and gets tough or whatever. And fortunately, for the ecotherapy book, we had put a lot of our effort into it right at the very beginning. And so the two years were mainly about them trying to rearrange and edit and things like that. So it, the book came out really well, actually. We're both happy with it. But I thought to myself, I want to publish my own books and I have to get into print my writings about basically what amounts to a, a terapsychological mapping of the entire state of California. Mm-hmm. Uh, it took me about 11 years to do that. And so I was too involved in the work itself to mess with commercial publishing. I didn't want my books stuffed into warehouses and just sitting there. So I investigated a little bit, and I realized that I could actually set up my own publishing company, World Soul Books, that I could take about six months to learn Quark Express, which is my typesetting software, and it produces camera-ready PDF files. And then I use a, a printer. I contract with a printer who prints on demand. So if you order one of my books that's through World Soul Books, then it takes about two weeks, but they print it up right for you. It's not, mm. It doesn't come from a warehouse or anything like that. So it's ecologically better, too. Yeah, and, and use it, recyclable paper and all that, so that's that's a good thing. Yeah, you know, I, I just love examples of technology that is, being put to good use. I mean, I love technology. In fact, I guess I should say, probably like a lot of people, I have kind of a love-hate relationship with it, but I've always embraced it, and and I think that there's a lot of good that can come out of it. Of course, there's also, you know, a lot of downside around it, which contributes to the way that our culture uh, has become and is dealing with things today. But going back to rebirth. I think that it's really profound what you're saying, what you've done as far as the print-on-demand kind of thing because 
speaking of technology, it feels to me like our world is just sped up so much in the last even few years with the proliferation of cell phones and, of course, smartphones where we just carry the technology with us all the time and everything is available in an instant. I, I think the immediacy of everything has sped up considerably. And so going back to Rebirth, it just feels to me like this is a book that you can sit with and it can bring you back into a much more reflective state. And you can sit and read any one of these essays in, in a very short sitting. Some of them are just a few pages. And so I really like the idea of using this book as almost a, a meditative kind of guideline to be able to just slow down for a few minutes each day. And I, I'm wondering if you have ideas about how you're going to go about working with the book in the month of June Will you be focusing on specific essays? Will you be asking people to read a few pages a week? Or what thoughts do you have as far as the best way, and, you know, whether it's during the month of June when we do this or, in fact, anyone who sits down with the book to read it for the first time, do you have recommendations on the best way that you think to read the book? I do. I, if I were doing it, I would open the book and I would I'd go to the table of contents and I would start with whatever really grabs your attention. And we made the titles pretty evocative so that they do exactly that. So you might go through, and Catherine Quick wrote a piece on <laughs> some conflicts and resolutions that she had with a house that she owned. And so her piece on coming home might get the attention. Or somebody who t- happens to be interested in San Francisco, that might jump out. We have three different writers who wrote different pieces about the city, and so that's in there in one big chapter. But I would I would be guided that way. I'd go into whatever grabs the attention, and then I would read that, and then I would look at the chapters right before and right after that one Mm. and see if if that continues the momentum, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, If it doesn't, I'd I'd go back to the table of contents and just grab another one. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, great. I love that because in in some ways it's it's almost like opening yourself to psyche and just letting psyche kind of give you what you're you're needing, you know, in that moment. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you you have published several books, and of course, this one now uh, came out toward the end of 2010, I think. So mm-hmm. you're you're due for another one. Do you have other books that are in the works right now? <laughs> um, I'm laughing because um, there's one I've been wanting to wanting and not wanting to write for a long time. I teach a class at JFK University and also at CIAS called Archetypal Mythology. And it's a world mythology class through a depth psychology lens. And I've never found a good book for that course. I've used some that I thought were really great. There's a book called Myth and Knowing that I really like. And then there's actually one called Mythology for Dummies that's not bad. I don't much care for the title, but it's a decent book. But most of the myth books I've looked at, they tend to be very scholarly works. And I would include those by Jungian authors as well. That's just such a natural combination, Myth and Young. I mean, it just goes together everywhere, you know. But most of those books don't tell the story as well. And so as an example, I've read a lot of Chinese mythology, but most of the books that deal with are highly academic, and they they analyze the myths and don't really tell the full story. And then I came across a book by Linda Wong, and it had a minimum of citations, but she was such a great storyteller that now it's my favorite book of Chinese stories. So I, I thought what I'd like to do is write a book for my graduate students, but that starts, first of all, with the stories so that we could actually read them out loud in class and just hear into what they have to say, and then the commentary comes later, and then maybe some study questions. So I'm working on a book on archetypal mythology that I hope to finish up by fall. I don't know if that's realistic or not, because every time time I start going into the stories to figure out what I want in there, I just get lost, you know. (laughs) I, I go into the into Ariadne's labyrinth, and you know, eventually she, you know, she throws me a little gold thread, and I get out again so that I can like eat and pay the bills. But, um. <laughs> well, yes. Well, I do find when you're doing this kind of work, the gods will have their way with you. So and they oh, don't yeah. particularly care if you have dinner that night. <laughs> no, Not they don't. The I love I love Hillman's comment. Something always has you in mind, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, it's great work that you're doing. Tell us a little bit about some of the other projects that you're working on, because I know you have a handful that are very juicy and starting to take off pretty well. Well, there's the one that you've been involved with to some extent, the Encyclopedia Sophia Project, and 
what we're doing is we meet at CIIS, and it's former students, current students, a mix of people. We're trying to put together a multi-platform resource for who we think of as culture mentors or culture therapists. And that refers to people who are doing deep cultural work of any kind. Examples would be, I, I always immediately think of Meredith Sabini's work with groups up here in the Bay Area, um, group dreamers. Mm -hmm. You know, having people speak their dreams and seeing all the different connections between them and between the dreamers and the earth. And she just, she's just she been doing that for some time. Or how to create community around a new garden, you know, on the corner of the busy street somewhere. Or how to do conflict resolution meetings in the corporate world, but have it really be deeper than the usual fixing and, and problem solving, you know. So wherever people are creating new forms of community, we feel that it would be great if they had a resource of each other's creative work. And so we're setting up the encyclopedia such that, oh, I don't know, let's say you're out doing something somewhere, maybe teaching a class, and you are asking yourself, you know, what would be a good exercise for dreaming the future up a little bit, imagining the future. So you'd access the encyclopedia, whether through surfing it online or iPhone or iPad or, or all of the above. And you might come across an article that was inspired by the work of Mary Watkins. And when I was her student, she taught me an exercise called utopic imagining. And it's a way of not only imagining and, and summoning up the imaginal presence of positive possible futures for the Earth, but also imagining steps to get there. It's a really powerful exercise. So there might be a written piece about this at the encyclopedia, but ideally there would also be video so that you could actually see somebody conducting a group like this. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of resource that, that we want to create. And we actually have a website now. It's new. It's encyclopediasofia.com. And we have a Facebook page for Encyclopedia Sophia as well for people who follow our work. And I'm getting ready to load up some sample articles uh, at the website. It doesn't have any right now. It's mostly under construction. But, yeah, it's moving forward. Yeah, there's been a lot of work that's gone into it. I, as you mentioned, I've been part of some of those meetings. And the idea is really, I think, very not only profound, but it's also it's like its time has come because, you know, I sort of look at it as a toolbox or a, an aggregate of all of these different techniques that so many people have come up with. You know, there's so much collective wisdom out there, and the idea of being able to put it in a kind of repository or a place where anybody can access it from a variety of different ways. You know, people talk a lot about, in the field of neuroscience, learning styles. And some of us are more visual, and some of us are more auditory, and we prefer to read or, or hear things. And some of us are more kinesthetic, and we just need to experience it. And so this idea of being able to appeal to almost every person on the planet in some way who can access it from some level, it, it just speaks to how we are able to bring something together as a collective. And I think it's, it's a really profound project. So I'm so excited to see you working on that. And I've been excited to see the passion around that as well. So many people that are involved in that and donating their time and going to meetings and bringing their skills to it to make it into a reality has been really rewarding to see that. And, and again, I just it feels like a project whose time has come. So encyclopediasofia.com, I hope everybody will go check that out. And if they want to be involved, anybody can participate, correct? Sure, yeah. Just send us an email and we'll tell you when we meet. Yeah, great. And there are even a lot of people who are not local and able to attend meetings in person who are involved in the project, following what's going on, submitting materials and ideas and that kind of thing. So no matter where you live, it's still a good option. Mm -hmm. And we've started doing conference calls during our meetings, too, so people can call in if they can't show up in San Francisco. Yeah, excellent. Great. And so what else? You have also begun work on a project that is using a symbol, which has also been very personal and very profound for me as well, and that's this idea of Earthrise, which is mm. the name of this photo, the first photo that was taken from space by the astronauts who saw the planet kind of hanging out there in space for the very first time. Tell us more about that. I'd like to. I just presented that for the – I put a slideshow together around it, and presented it at an eco-psychology conference a couple of weeks ago, and it went really well, and I got some great feedback on it. And The idea for it is about three or four years ago, I received a small grant from Opus Archives, and they're an organization in Santa Barbara connected with Pacifica Graduate Institute, 
and they have the collected works of all these amazing scholars, Maria Gambudis, Joseph Campbell, all kinds of great people. And Opus Archives is in pursuit of this idea of a myth for our time. And so the scholars all address that question, what is the myth for our time? Is there something in the archives that can help us understand it? That sort of thing. So I took my lead from Campbell. And when Joseph Campbell was interviewed by Mill Moyers, he brought up something that he had talked about in other interviews, which was the significance of Earthrise and how it might hold the key to understanding the myth of our time. And Campbell, he didn't correct Moyers during the interview, but in other places where it was appropriate to be a bit more scholarly and correct about it, he mentioned that there is no one myth that could ever encapsulate all of human experience. There never really was. So it's, it's not this grand narrative that's going to sum up all of what's happening in our era. But he did feel that there were mythic images that would bubble up from the collective consciousness of our time, and that Earthrise was one of them. Mm. So when you look over the transcript of the, the astronauts who saw the Earth rise above the horizon of the moon in 1968 on the day before Christmas, their first response to it is aesthetic. They go, wow, look how pretty that is, <laughs> and grab a camera, you know. And so it's a, it's a heartful response. And I think that Campbell was right about that being the mythologem for our time, the, a possible starting point for a lot of different realignments that have taken place since that photograph was snapped. So my slideshow tries to unpack the image of Earthrise as an image of participation and worldwide networking and worldwide culture and other things that have been up for all of us. And then there's, of course, the shadow side of Earthrise, which is globalization, unchecked globalization. So, it, you know, every mythic image comes up with both of those, you know, all of its intensity and, and richness and shadows and everything else. And so in the slideshow, I try to make a case for that not only being a guiding vision for creating new kinds of international culture on Earth, but also being a summons to really living differently as the age of empires, I hope, finally comes to an end. You know, we've been living like this pretty much since Sargon I captured Sumer in uh, about 2300 BC. We've, you know, we've been immersed in this long age of wars and empires and battles and struggles and scarcity and all the rest of it. And it seems to me that it's really time to outgrow all that. Mm -hmm. And so... It, I think that Earthrise holds the possibility given to us by Joseph Campbell for having an image to rally around all of us who are working for living on this planet differently and more consciously and more more like responsible adults rather than exploitive, battling children. So in a nutshell, that's what I'm presenting with the slideshow. And I should add that I'm also willing to, I did it in Keynote, and then I have a copy in PowerPoint as well. If anybody who wants either version you know, if they send me something to put it on or a place to upload it, it's a really big slideshow. Everybody's free to have it, so I'd be glad to make it available. Hmm. Maybe we can make that available even through Depth Psychology Alliance in some way to the community. So we Great. can talk about that uh, offline. But I, I, I just think it's such powerful work and, and again, so needed in, in our culture today. So so glad that you're you're taking that on. We just have a, a, a couple more minutes, but I... You, you hooked me when you mentioned in pretty much briefly in passing your SOMA tour, the, the tour that you do with grad students when you take them south of market in San Francisco and then you look for mythic images. And I've been thinking about this since you said it, so I'm wondering if you'll share maybe just one or two specific examples of what you guys have found to interpret or translate and what it meant. I'd be glad to. Um, we start with the idea that Market Street is a sort of analog to where the conscious and the unconscious meet. And so everything above or north of market is kind of ego and superego territory for the city. And so, of course, above market are City Hall and Union Plaza. And Freud mentioned that the superego is not just, for instance, the law schools that are also up there and the, the legal apparatus. But for Freud, superego also meant forms of higher culture. So a lot of the museums are up there as well and art institutes. Whereas below the line where market is, um, that's into the unconscious. And so immediately below it, there's a lot of water imagery in the neighborhoods and street names and buildings. And as you go further south, you pass through all these very shadowy neighborhoods, broken, crime-ridden, very destroyed looking. And then you pass several streets with names like Jesse, Natoma, and Minna. They're all named after prominent gold rush sex workers 
who became very prominent in the community in San Francisco. And so that's our anima, the anima of Soma. And then if you go further, as Jung said, during down in the deeper layers of the unconscious where the big spiritual and archetypal underworld images begin to stir, we find St. Joseph's Church on the corner of 10th and Howard. And the church right now is empty and abandoned and very neglected looking. And there are things around the church that give further substantiation to the idea that it's an underworld. When we were walking around it, someone had spray painted a pair of wings on one side of the building. So we started talking about Icarus and his father, Daedalus, the constructor of the labyrinth that held the Minotaur. And incidentally, the building itself was purchased in 2008 by a contractor who lost a lot of his money when the market crashed. And so now it's just sitting there. And then a little further down is a small parking space. And somebody there had put graffiti that said Gnome Parking, spelled G-N-O-M-E, Parking. <laughs> so if you're a gnome, that's a great place to park and see the church. <laughs> and so uh, and another piece, not far from that, someone had scratched into a window a number of different letters, but the ones that lined up were F-O-R-M-O-R. And so for mythology instructor, that must mean Formorians, who were some of the underworld figures of Celtic mythology, similar to the titans of Greek mythology. I could give other examples, but that's how we try to find some kind of substantiation for whether there really is a mythology active in a particular neighborhood. And the more examples of it we find, the more certain we become that, that, yeah, this is what this represents in the city of the psyche. So that's a short example. We actually end up seeing about two dozen different things as we go, and we always notice new things, too, so that adds to it. Yeah, well, I mean, like any landscape, it's constantly changing, and so I'm sure there are new sort of symbols and images that rise up probably on a daily basis, if not minute by minute. It's really a yeah. fascinating way to look at things. I, I love it. And, and it's very, as you say, it's very terapsychological. I just want to close this out here by reading just a very short description that you offer in the intro to the book, Rebirth, Conversations with the World and Souls. You say, terapsychology explores how the patterns, shapes, features, and motifs that play in the non-human world sculpt our ideas, our habits, our relationships, culture, and sense of self. Whether we know it or not, we speak all the time in the discourse of nature, terrain, and place. Their jagged places, roughening our turns of phrase, rivers carrying our endeavors onward, skyscrapers tempting us to irresponsible heights, polluted bays polluting our moods, corridors of wildlife preserving our pathways of sanity. So much rich imagery in that. It's such a powerful practice, this idea of terapsychology. It's such a rich, rich piece of work, and I'm just really grateful that you're doing this work, Craig, and I look forward to you being our featured author with the book Rebirth, Conversations with the World in Souls in the month of June. Uh, if people want to find out more about Craig, you can visit his website at chalquist.com, C-H-A-L. Q-U-I-S-T.com. And Craig, is that the best place to order the book, Rebirth, Conversations with the World and Soul, as well? Yes, it is. If you just click on books, it'll take you to places to order it. Great. Craig, thanks so much for being with me today. I really appreciate your time. And, and again, thanks for all the good work that you're doing. Thank you very much, Bonnie, and your good work as well and your hard work on the Alliance. And I'm looking forward to June. 